present and make sure that I am recording which I am um, can you guys see this diagram that I have up yes yes we, we can okay thank you um, so let's begin let's just talk about the four parts of a microwave and then I have one here so I can actually like show you on the schematic and then show you in the machine and and what we do and how we do it but um, there's one part of this microwave I'm gonna copy it real quick and, and um, put it in another document real quick give me one second Okay, it's, excuse me for the blurriness, but it's screenshot and it's um, it, when it copies, it doesn't get real high resolution. But uh, let's begin. We're talking about the four main parts that make microwaves. You know, everything in a microwave uh, is either a control, safety, or just these four parts are the only four parts we need to actually make uh, microwaves. Uh, I'm going to make it just a little bit smaller in case anybody comes in I might not see them pop up. Okay so you have this transformer, you have a capacitor, you have the magnetron and you have uh, two outputs of this transformer. So right here on this transformer the most important part you need to know when you're checking a microwave is the, let me go to a little bit larger uh, is the voltage that comes in to the transformer that's that's let's say microwave runs and don't heat fans are running timers timing down turntable seems to be moving but you have no heat at all your first test on this uh, microwave is at this transformer this transformer is what separates all of the controls and safeties from the cooking components if I wanted to check a microwave and I thought the problem was a capacitor, magnetron, or something in the high voltage section, if I wanted to, I could actually put a test cord and put one wire here and one wire here on the transformer. So let me switch back to this screen here of the microwave. And if we look at this microwave, we have this transformer right here. Transformer has some wires going up to the magnetron and right here is the input voltage of the transformer these two wires right here and they're connected to your door switches and, and your controls inside the microwave so this is our starting point if we wanted to and I'll see if I can turn it a little bit more for you to see it and this is a, this is a unique microwave this has two inputs on the transformer but right here I don't know if you can see them, there is uh, terminals here and these wires went right to it. These are your main wires right here, your blue and your white. So if you wanted to check microwave runs and don't heat, you're going to take your meter and let me grab a meter here. Oh, my digital one, the battery's dead. So I'm going to have to go with my analog. So you're going to go here with your microwave and leave these on your transformer. I just took them off to show them to you. Put your voltmeter on 120 volts AC. And I'm going to go over here and just pretend like I'm doing that. I'm on 250 here on, on the meter if you can, can see it, 250. And what you want to do is you want to plug your meter leads into the back of these prongs here and once your meters are is set there you want to go ahead and turn your microwave on and see if you have voltage at that input on the transformer here 
okay? If you have 120 volts, your problem is one of the four high voltage components. If you don't have 120, the problem's within the microwave, and I'm not going to get into that yet. I want to talk about the four parts and what they do and, and, and how to test them. So one of the most common problems are going to be a bad magnetron, a bad capacitor, and diode. The transformer is usually one of the last things that you want to replace if you have a microwave running and no heating. So if you have 120 here, the first thing you want to do is you want to discharge your capacitor. So you have all these wires in here and you're like, well, how do I discharge a capacitor? One of the ways you can do it is they say you use a 10,000 ohm resistor and you hold the resistor with a pair of needle-nose pliers and you touch the two terminals in there and let it discharge. Uh, what most people do, uh, unplug the machine and you're going to put one screwdriver in one side of the capacitor like so and you're going to put another screwdriver inside the other side of the capacitor and all you have to do is just touch the two pieces of metal together just like that. Discharging the capacitor will only take a second. As soon as they touch, the capacitor is discharged. So you can stick your hands in there all day, no problem. Now, I want you to notice this because uh, a lot of guys end up changing the capacitor, dial, magnetron. Sometimes they change all three. Um, and one of the things they do is they wire this capacitor up wrong. And this capacitor sometimes has two wires and the diode or one wire and a diode but we'll always have one wire all by itself now you're like okay let's take a look at that diagram for a second and see what it is uh, where's that diagram I just had <laughs> give me a second here I'll just go to this screen here Okay, so I don't know if you can see this diagram here. No, that one's too small. Give me a second, guys. I had a, a diagram window here, and I'm trying to find the picture. Here we go. All right, so let's share that screen again. So if you look at this diagram that we were just talking about, the transformer has the input voltage and it has two windings. This is the, the primary winding where power comes in. This is where 120 volts is. And this and this are considered, uh, give me a second guys. This and this is our secondary windings within our transformer, okay? This one, is our high voltage winding and this one is our low voltage winding now we're not going to check voltage once we check input voltage of 120 coming into this transformer everything's going to be done with ohms and continuity okay and one of the two things we want to start off with is the capacitor and diode now this diagram is misleading so I'm gonna I'm gonna make a change to this diagram uh, let me let me uh, bring a different window in here. I'm using three different windows and screens and stuff like that. But um, if you look at, can you see this other diagram here that I'm moving around? Yes. Okay. So this is that same diagram. I screenshot it from here. What I want to do is I want to do this. I want to take this off right here. This line, because this line's misleading. There's no wire here. A lot of people think that that's a wire, and it's not. What it is is all of those are, are just ground. And I'm going to rotate it right. So there's one here going to ground, and there's another one, and rotate it right and the dial goes to ground. So this is in reality what you're seeing. You're seeing the transformer 
only has one wire on the high voltage coming off. The other side of the wire is ground. The diode goes to ground and the magnetron has a ground when it's screwed into the machine. So when we're wiring a capacitor, if you look at this capacitor now, there's only one wire on this side of the capacitor, which is the high voltage wire. The other side is the diode, the low voltage transformer, and the magnetron. So sometimes you might see two wires in a diode here or one wire in a diode here, but that is when you look at a capacitor, you want to make sure that the high voltage is always by itself. So let's go back to the, uh, um, the microwave screen here. So if we're looking at it, this little red wire goes to the top winding on the transformer. And it's, I don't know if you can see it right there. Let me see if I can add a little more light to it. There's a rivet right on that transformer. That rivet is the other side of the high voltage right there. Let me see if I can get my light in there. That still don't help. How about here? Maybe you guys can see it now. But there's a rivet right there. And that rivet is going to this transformer winding right here. Okay? The other side of that rivet, if I wanted to check the high voltage winding for ohms, I would go from that rivet to this red wire. Now you're like, okay, well, how do I know which one's the high voltage? How do I know which one's the low voltage? Well, the low voltage goes, uh, you notice they're both white. They're a different color, but sometimes they put them the same color. But if you look underneath the transformer, I'm going I'm to move the camera in a second, and you look underneath the transformer here, and you're going to see a wire. Um, let me see if I can put my light in the camera so you guys can see. You're going to see a wire underneath the high voltage transformer right there, that white wire. Let me see if I can show it a little bit better. Um, it's not part of the high voltage. It is on the high voltage side, but it's not part. Let me see if I can show it better here, the back side of it. And you really can't see that wire on this one either. On uh, most of them, you can see that white wire running underneath the high voltage transformer so you'll be able to identify it when you physically look at it. That's called the filament winding. So let's go back to the microwave. Here. Trying to maneuver this camera by myself without someone helping me is hard too. <laughs> so when we're looking at this microwave here we need to make sure that when we take off the capacitor and dial, we want to test it. We want to take this red wire and make sure this red wire is always by itself. And some people ask, well, what, how do I know the red wire goes here or the red wire goes there and everything else goes on the other side? In, in, in this case, the capacitor is AC voltage, so it really doesn't matter which side the red wire is on and which side these are on, just as long as the low voltage and the diode are on the same side of the capacitor. So let's talk about testing. You go there, you check input voltage. Now this is very unique. This transformer actually has two input windings. And what they do is if they energize both, you get high heat. If they energize only one, they actually get a lower output power. That's very rare for microwaves nowadays to see three wires coming in. But this blue and white, just to say, for, for the most sake, most microwaves only have two wires coming in, and that's where you would check for power on this blue and white. So when we go to the capacitor and diode, if we got voltage here, we want to check the capacitor and diode next. Now, removing these wires, they're a little bit tricky, and I'll show you why. Let me first take this screw out. So here we have our capacitor and our diode came off. Now on these wires, the manufacturers put these little tiny locking uh, pins. And I want to say this was done when microwaves came out, they didn't have all these. And um, a lot of technicians didn't know how to work on microwaves even back then. 
and they put these little let me see if I can zoom in on it to show you they put these little tiny pins right in the middle I, I guess the camera's not that clear to see it that you have to push down right there to pull it off the capacitor um, the reason why that is and I'll tell you a quick story is uh, a lot of technicians that do warranty work for companies they go out and find um, customer wasn't using it right or something um, and they just do a customer instruct and then they're like wow if I just instruct the customer on how to use this microwave manufacturers not gonna pay me to come out and repair it so what does a technician say oh found loose wire on the door switch found loose wire in a capacitor well the manufacturers got so many service calls saying found loose wire manufacturer said oh we'll fix them We'll put these little locks on here so when we put these wires on there's no way they're going to come off in shipping and now you guys have to find them every time you go to pull off so let's take a look at the capacitor the capacitor here is got um let me show you it's, it's the wiring diagram there the capacitor is the symbol on the bottom which is like like an open like two lines that are open and then above it that is a bleed resistor so when you use the microwave and shut the microwave off that resistor is supposed to take away the charge that's built up in the microwave so if you walked and put your hand in there after the microwave has been off for a couple of days it probably would not have any charge at all so the only reason why we discharge it is so we don't get shocked in case that didn't work so again just to discharge it you're gonna put one screwdriver here and you want to make sure that you're touching the prongs in there that the wire goes on. It doesn't matter which one. So you're going to touch one here, take the other screwdriver, touch one here, and then you're just going to touch the two metal screwdrivers together. And you know, keep your hands on the plastic or rubber or weird gloves um, to discharge it. Now this capacitor is usually a 0.9 something microfarads, and if you uh, let's see if I get it clear here. Maybe it's focusing on my hand and not this, but uh, you can probably see it right, right in here, um, right above my finger, right there. It says uh, I had it clear for a second, but it says 0.95 microfarads. That's less than one microfarad. If any of you guys do ACs. The fan motor on an AC is usually 5 microfarad. The compressors are like 35 microfarad. This is less than 1 microfarad, but it handles high voltage. So how do we test it? Well, with a digital meter, some of them have a capacitance tester, and you put it on the capacitance scale, and it says uh, 0.95. But what if you have a digital or an analog meter? Now, my, my battery's dead on my digital, but I'm going to show you an analog meter. Uh, because it does actually show you a little better how to check that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my meter on the high ohm scale and I'm just going to test to make sure that my needle's working on my ohm scale here. And basically when you have a digital meter that don't have a capacitance tester or an analog meter that doesn't have a capacitance tester, let's see if I can change it there so you can see the needle better doesn't have a capacitance tester what's going to happen is when you touch the meter leads the needle is going to jump like that and return it's going to jump and return now I'm going to do the capacitor in a second and show you but I want you to see that you're going to see jump and then return back to infinity so capacitors are like batteries they store a charge and then they release a charge but since we have AC voltage going to it a battery like one side be positive and one side be negative the capacitor the positive and negative are constantly switching with the AC voltage because AC is going one way then the other way that would be like your positive and negative so when you're testing you go to high ohm scale because it uses higher power off your battery and then what you want to do is just touch one side of the capacitor here and the other side of the capacitor here and I don't know if you saw it I might have went too fast I'll do it again the needle jumped and then returned back to infinity. I can let me uh, situate myself here and the capacitor here. Now, when you do that and you test it, 
your needle is going to jump and return back to infinity, the jump is telling you that your capacitor is discharging and when it returns back to infinity, that is the capacitor charging up but changing the plus minus. So you notice our meter, we have a red and a black, that's our plus minus. So what I want to do is I'm going to move my red one to the other side, just turn the capacitor around, and my black one to the other side, and then the needle will jump and go back. So why is it going up and down if I don't have no power? Is because the battery in the meter is what's charging it, and then it's discharging, causing the needle to jump, and now I'm charging it back up, so I have to reverse the polarity and do this. If your capacitor is jumping like this, or if you use a digital meter, what's going to happen is it's going to say OL, and then when you touch it with a digital meter, the numbers are going to start to jump up and climb back and then return back to OL, or read the resistor inside their very high resistance. If that's happening, assume your capacitor is good if you don't have one to check the farad value of your capacitor. So you can stick it on there, see the needle jump, and then return, you know the capacitor's charging and the capacitor's discharging. So that's a way to check the capacitor. Your digital meter, the numbers are gonna jump up and they're gonna return down, and just like the analog, we have to switch the red and the black leads on the capacitor to test that. So if that does it, assume your capacitor is good. Now we have our diode. Let me go ahead and just remove that diode from the uh, microwave. And I'm not going to be able to remove it. Someone put the wrong screw in there and there's a nut on the back side. There should be a nut here. But we can test it right on the, um, right on the microwave as long as I have this end free. To test a capacitor, capacitors are like what we call a check valve. They only let power flow one way uh, through them. This meter here is about 35, 40 bucks on Amazon. I really like this meter. I have, I have another analog meter that I really, really like, but they stopped making it from UEI. Um, the thing about this meter is it has one nine volt and two AA batteries inside. And they are enough power internal to check a diode. Most of these digital meters here, like this one here, they only use one 9-volt battery, so you cannot test them with this. They tell you, oh, you got to get another 9-volt battery and attach one of those batteries to your meter lead, so now you got the battery of the meter and the battery that you added to this to check the diode. I, I, I don't see that making sense. Even some of those digital meters show that they check diodes, but they do not have the power to do it. So in this case, if I want to check this diode, I'm going to go to the 10K ohm scale, and I'm going to touch ground, and I'm going to touch the other side of the diode, and I should get about 50 to 70,000 ohms. Now if I can turn that meter just a little bit more for you to see it. Hold on one second. Oh, I forgot I have a light on my meter. It'll go off in a second, guys. Um, so let me, let me wait for that light to go off in, in, in here uh, so you can see the scale. So when we check, we're going to put one meter lead here and one meter lead on ground. And you see this case, I'm not reading anything. All right, the needle's not moving. I'll, I'll take the black one off and touch it, nothing happened. That's normal. Now if I reverse it, I should get a reading here. Make sure you're not touching it with your fingers. If you see, the meter's actually reading through my fingers. So make sure that you do not use your fingers to, to hold it down. Go here, stick the other one inside of here, and as you can see, the scale went over. And I probably need to, let me see if I zero my meter first because it may not be adjusted properly. And so we want to have continuity through it on the other side like that. And that one's giving me approximately 10. So that's almost. Uh, 100,000 ohms, which is okay because this microwave has a, a bigger transformer, so it's going to need a bigger diode. So if you get a reading both ways, where you take the meter lead and switch it this way and that way, and you get a reading both ways across your diode, your diode shorted and bad. If that happens, you'll usually hear a loud grinding noise, like, eh, and that microwave will run. 
but will not heat probably if this is shorted. If this is shorted, I recommend changing the magnetron as well. Now the other um, thing that could happen is if the capacitor shorts, one thing if a capacitor shorts out, you'll notice that that'll probably blow a breaker or blow a fuse internal in the microwave. A shorted capacitor has a different symptom than a shorted diode. A shorted diode is usually a loud noise and omen it out. Even with a basic digital ohm meter, if it is shorted, you will get a reading. You don't need to buy a second meter to do that test. The capacitor, you don't need to buy a meter to do it, the test on a capacitor. I just like my meter because I'm able to actually get the resistance value of that diode. If the capacitor and diode check good, there are instructions on how to check the magnetron and transformer, but sometimes ohming them out doesn't always give you the best result. Let me switch um, to a, another uh, image here. I'm going to share my screen one more time. And I'm going to bring up my, my slideshow here. If you look in that diagram that I attached to the email, this wiring diagram, what I really liked about it is it gave you um, it gave you tests on how to check the door switches. Um, if we look over here, it has instructions on how to ohm out the magnetron, the uh, transformer, the capacitor, and the diode. The actual testing procedures are here on this schematic. So even though it's not, this is a Whirlpool diagram by the way, even though <clears throat> it's not the machine you're working on, Capacitors and diodes and magnetrons all test the same. Now, if we look at this magnetron, one of the items that we have that, that's uh, hard to, to do is it says that the magnetron filament it normally is less than 1 ohm. Uh, filament to chassis normal is infinite. So when they're saying to check this magnetron out, take the wires off. Take your ohm meter, and I'll bring it back over here. Take your ohm meter. Now I'm going to go to the lowest scale because I want less than one ohm. And on analog, we have to adjust the needle every time we change the scale. Like that. And then I'm going to touch and should have less than one ohm. Now look, that's zero. But this is a good working microwave. So you could have that same resistance and the microwave be short, the magnetron be shorted internally or the magnetron itself be bad. So ohming out a magnetron, I'm going to tell you right now, I've never successfully ohmed out a magnetron and replaced that magnetron. Um, someone got a question? Okay, removing power from the capacitor with screwdriver, does that kill power to magnetron and transformer? Okay, when we do the uh, power with the, with the screwdrivers, when we do this, this is not done while the microwave is plugged in and on. This is so that we want to test it, we want to discharge the capacitor. Um, I'm not quite sure what that question is asking. Can you elaborate on the question? Yes, sir, Rick. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. My question is, with the with the machine unplugged, and and you and you hit it with the screwdriver and you discharge the capacitor, am, am I free to remove wires from the from the megatron and and the transformer and all that, or do I have to worry about getting shocked? No, that is where you would get shocked. If you unplug this microwave, and you go ahead and you. Um, you discharge the capacitor like I showed you, you can stick your hand in and touch everything here. There's no voltage anywhere. As long as the microwave's Beautiful. unplugged and you didn't turn it back on again, if you turned it back on for a test, you want to discharge it again every time before you open it up. For every service. time. But other than Thank that, you. That's, Thank you. that's why we discharge it is so that we don't get shocked while we're doing it, okay? Okay, thank you. That was my question. Thank you. No problem. So going back to our screen, and I don't even know which one I'm showing anymore. <laughs> Going back to our screen, when we ohm out our magnetron, 
That is hard to tell. I always tell people if it runs and don't heat and your cap and your diode check well, usually your magnetron's bad. So a lot of people say, well, I don't even do microwaves because it's not worth fixing. Um, there, you always get those customers that don't want to replace the microwave because it matches all the other appliances in their home. They have to go through pulling it down and having a, one go to the store, order it, have someone come and install a new one. That installation process sometimes is a nightmare, especially if you don't have the right person. But when we're um, when we're doing a magnetron, one of the things you want to do is you want to say, well, can I find the magnetron cheaper than is if I was buying it from uh, the, the OEM, the original uh, equipment manufacturer? Like if this is a Whirlpool microwave with with a Whirlpool magnetron. Believe it or not, there's a company I, I attached a manual for you guys um, let me go back to my screen here and go back I have to minimize and I'll have to share and I'm going to if you look at at this document that I sent you guys um, on page 27 there's a way to find replacement magnetrons um, that will uh, work uh, the same as, as the ones that are already in there as a matter of fact they're probably made by one of these companies and then just put the uh, the information on them from the manufacturer just to sell it let me go ahead and take this magnetron out for a second get the stuff out of the way and show you how this works for testing for replacement magnetron now the next class I'll give I'll give a class on all the controls and like um, like door switches I think I have one or two videos just about door switches out there too um, So, wow, they made it hard with this cover on here. This is just a, for airflow. I'll go over some of these other parts if we have time today. So let's say, okay, I got a bad magnetron. The new one's $120. Well, hell, I can get a microwave for $150. Um, so, uh, but I have to replace this magnetron. Let's say the customer spent four or five hundred dollars on a microwave and, and willing to spend two hundred dollars to fix it. So, when you when you want to do this microwave, one of the things you want to do is first you want to match up the kilovolt rating, the rating which is the power rating at this magnetron. So the instructions say uh, the magnetron can't be turned without elaborate testing. Uh, you rely on the research done by microwave engineers. Blah blah blah. So first thing you want to do, step number one, is you want to look at the numbers that they gave you here, like the OM52, OM55, OM72, and I don't know if you guys can see on the, on the other camera, this one here is a 2M282J. I don't know, can you guys see that in the other camera? I only see the documentation. Okay, let me see if I can go stop sharing for a second and go to the to this one. So on this magnetron, we have a 2M282J. Okay, so that's that's the number that I want. And I don't know why I'm looking at it. It looks backwards to me, but 2M82J. Let's go back to share again. And on, on that document, we want to go to uh, here, and we want a 2M82J. And, um, wow, I don't even see a 2M. I'm sorry, 2M282. So we're going to look at 2M282. 2M282. Two would be 
right here, 2M282. That's right here. That's 4.35 kilovolts. So now you know the voltage. Okay? That's all you need to know so far. So let's go to the next screen. Once you determine the voltage, there's only two more things you need to do to determine what magnetron is going to uh, be the one that you are, are going to use. Now, look down here at step three real quick, and here's the kilovolt rating of the replacement magnetrons. And there's only two that, that actually match the 4.3 kilovolt rating. Everything else is going to be smaller power and cannot handle the output power. And they tell you it's on page 24 here. But now you say, well, how do we know which one of these two to use? So we go to here to the size, and they say, first thing you want to do is we got three different types. We've got a standard, a compact, and a subcompact model. So we want to look at them. And the other important things are the screw holes. The screw holes can be the same side as the venting airflow or opposite, and I'll show you that in a minute. So we want to look at our configurations. We want to look at um, whether the, the screws here are the same direction as the airflow, or in this case, these are on the opposite side of the airflow, but these are on the same side of the airflow. And then here uh, is another way that they can, they can do it, and the difference would be where the wire terminals are on this. Hold on one second. So if we looked at, at that screen, let's go back to whether I have a standard, compact, and subcompact. I'm going to have to bring in the regular PDF because the quality is not that good on that image. So if I go here and we go to this screen here, it's probably easier for you guys to read than, than that screenshot I want, is we want to look at the magnetron and, and see right now we want to measure the distance of the magnetron uh, width and length. And so if it's 95 millimeters by 80 millimeters or 80 by 80 or 73 by 70, give me one second. We want to go to here, and I'm going to stop sharing for a second so you can see. So what we want to do is we want to measure the width from here to here and the width from here to here. So this one here, I don't have metric on here, but this one here is three inches by three and a half inches, so it's not even on both sides. So if we've got a calculator and figured out three inches by three and a half inches, and we went back to that screen we were looking at, We're probably going to have the standard one where you notice this one is larger than that one. This one, they're both the same size, and this one, they're different size, but it's a real small magnetron. So we probably have a standard magnetron. So that's important. So we determined one that our magnetron was this one here, 4.35 kilovolts, 2M282. We determined we have a standard size magnetron, which is the actual physical size of it. Now we need to know E, H, J, or K configuration. And that is the screw holes, the airflow, and the wire terminals. Where are the orientation? If you look, these screw holes are not where the vents are, but these are where the vents are. And then the second two, notice the wire terminals on these two, different from these two. These two wire terminals are on the same side of the air vents. These two terminals are not on this airflow. They're on this other side. So if we looked at our um, magnetron here, go back to uh, our meeting screen here, we have screws are on the same side of the vent, but the wire terminals are not. They're opposite the vent. So let's take a look at those configurations and see which configuration do we have. See if you guys can figure that out. Look at that magnetron sizing. 
Which one of these four do you think we have? If you want, I'll show you the screen we, again. We, we cannot see the screen. We... You're not, oh, yeah, that's right. So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the Megatron again. Screws and vents the same. Terminals are opposite it. Let me get a screen share. And so which one of these do we have? Any guess? J. J I would say is the second one. J is the correct one because if you look at J, the mounting ears and the vents are on the same side, but the filaments are opposite. This one, the filament is opposite, but the screws are the same size of filament. If we go back to our, our picture here, that the, the, we call them the ears or whatever, the mounting screws, they're on the same side of the vent, but this is different. So that's a J configuration. So once you guys do this a couple of times, it, it becomes a lot easier. For me trying to explain it and go back and forth between the cameras and the, and the actual piece is a little hard, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it. Um, so going back to it, so let's, let's go back. We determine we have a 4.35 kilovolt magnetron. We determined we had the standard size based on the measurement. We determined we have a J configuration. There's two more measurements we need to take and we're done. One is the height of the antenna on top of the magnetron. This piece that goes up and down on the magnetron. And we, I'm gonna tell you right now, we have a standard one. And then we need to measure the screw holes. 95 millimeter, 114 millimeter, but basically most brackets have all those screw holes there and, and they don't give you much options here. So if we look here, we have a standard and we said we have a J configuration. We don't have a J configuration here. And we have a 30 millimeter antenna. So the only thing that we could make work would be going down just a tiny little bit from 4.3 to 4.1 and this would be the magnetron we would use 4.1 kilovolt it's a J configuration 30 millimeter antenna that should work let's go ahead and take this part number and that's QB products part number and I'm just gonna Google search it and I can find that magnetron for 40 bucks if I wanted to go to a parts distributor, I might find the same magnetron for this microwave for 110, 120, 150 bucks. But you can get this magnetron for 40 bucks. Now, this one, no. This one here would be the exact unit that we're looking for. And if we looked at that picture, that is our magnetron. The only difference is we lose a hundred kilowatts it won't be as powerful as the original but you will get a completed call and the customer probably will not notice the slight difference in uh, magnetrons so uh, this is how you would get a replacement magnetron so let's recap this real quick microwave runs and don't heat what's the first thing we do guys check for any coming voltage yes we check for 120 coming into the transformer we have 120 what's our next test next text uh, we check the capacitor to find out um, if it's a weighted uh, value so we check a capacitor and our capacitor tests good now what there's the diode Check the dial. Now, you got a regular digital meter, and the meter says OL. That's bad. Not really, because most meters will not read it. Again, remember, you have to use. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to switch, 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 switch position uh, of the meter lead. 
No, but not just that, uh, Jonas. Yes, you do have to check polarity on it, but I was just saying OL no matter how you test it. Um, but on a standard meter, remember, you have to have a second battery in order to do that. And what you would do, let me let me share my screen again. And I'm gonna go. Give me one second here. I'm just gonna get a picture of a diode and go into my drawing tool here. Give me a second. So if you had a diode here and you're like, well, how do I test it? You're going to take a 9-volt battery and uh, let's just say this is my 9-volt battery here. Terrible drawing. And you're going to connect one of the diode leads to the battery. And then this is your meter here. And you're going to take one meter lead and stick it here, and the other meter lead you're going to stick it on the battery. So you're putting the battery in series with the diode. That's the only way these lesser expensive uh, digital meters, even fluke meters, believe it or not, only have one 9 volt battery and will not test this diode. You have to use a second battery. That's one of the reasons why I stick with my analog meter because it uses two nine volts and a, I'm sorry two double A's and a nine volt and when you go to the highest ohm scale it uses all the batteries in your meter and allows you to check them so that it me is there any questions about how to check the diode and the capacitor no okay so let me uh, try to bring my uh, screen back up here and uh, so high voltage voltage comes into your transformer your transformer steps that voltage up and it steps it down in our schematic I'm going back to share again just so you understand how the uh, how this works 120 comes in here to our transformer on our primary winding. This side steps it up to 2,000 volts. So we get 2,000 volts here on, on the um, secondary transformer. This is 3.4 or 4.0 volts. These two heat up the magnetron. This one charges the capacitor. And when the voltage changes, it goes back through through the diode and that voltage comes to the other side. So when it charges the capacitor, 2,000 volts are charged from this transformer, but when it changes direction, that 2,000 volts wants to flow back, but there's already 2,000 here, so that makes it 4,000. And when it goes through the diode, it only goes one way, so that's what makes it DC, is this diode right here. So. It puts 4,000, about 3,800 volts on this side, and then the AC voltage changes direction again and wants to charge this side up. Well, this voltage here is no longer being pushed by going through the diode, so it changes direction the other way, and instead of going through the diode, it's blocked here. It comes down and runs here and goes to the magnetron, and that's what sends the microwaves out for cooking. Now, I know. A big explanation you don't need to know all that when you're fixing a microwave you just need to know okay microwave runs don't heat do I have 120 coming in yes check my cap and diode if they both check good most likely change the magnetron if the capacitor shorted it's probably gonna blow a fuse if you got a microwave continuing to blow a fuse it's either the interlock switch on the door or the capacitor are the two most common things you would check if you have a short circuit in the microwave. So uh, what I tell people to do is to take the two wires off of the transformer coming in and run the microwave again. If it still blows the fuse, it's none of these high voltage components if you took these two wires off, the brown and the white. Okay? If it's still blowing the fuse, it's not our high voltage components. 
So that's how we know if we have a short circuit. Now we have three door switches in our diagram. I, I got the interlock switch here. Let me see if I can show you all three. Yeah, they're right here. Um, we got the primary door switch here. We got the monitor switch and we got what we call a secondary switch. Each one of them are have their own purpose. Let me see if I can show you on the diagram and then I'm going to show you inside the microwave. The primary interlock switch, look at this here. This is important. If you could look and see how it's wired, you can understand just by looking at the microwave if this switch is good or bad. When you run the microwave, notice the cavity lamp. This is the lamp inside the microwave when you're cooking, you see your food. It doesn't go through the door switch. It goes right to the light from the power supply coming in. After the door switch, your fan motor, your turntable motor, and your transformer and high voltage components all go through that door switch. So if the microwave runs, you press start, and the clock starts counting down, but the only thing you see is the light. You don't see the turntable rotating inside. You don't hear the fan, which is the fan that cools the magnetron, and you don't uh, hear the transformer humming. Right away, primary door switch. Right away. That's it. You don't need to even check it. Most microwaves, the primary door switch will disable the fan and turntable, but the light will still work and we will not have any high voltage cooking. Now, the secondary door switch over here, notice how this is connected to the control board over here with just two wires coming in and out. It says ground, but that's not important. But power comes in and goes out. If this door switch is bad, two things will happen. One, when the door's closed, the fan motor and turntable will run, even without pressing start. As soon as I close this door and this switch does not close, it tells relay number one to close, which is supposed to turn the light on. So when a customer opens the door of the microwave, the light comes on. That's how it knows to turn the light on inside is by the secondary door switch. But the other thing that secondary door switch will do is that if it's bad, it will not even let you press start on the microwave. You're, you press time, 200, and when you press start, you don't hear any beeping, you don't see anything moving, uh, nothing happens. This is one of the first things you want to check is your secondary door switch. So when you look at the microwave, you can identify those door switches by color wires of the diagram, but I'll show you in a minute how, how you can also find this door switch just by the way it's wired. Now the monitor switch, if I remove this switch from the microwave, microwave would work just fine. It won't blow a fuse, it, it, it'll run in heat, you, it, microwave wouldn't even know you took it out. The only time that that switch is even supposed to work is that if this door switch and the primary door switch are closed at the same time and the relay on the transformer is closed, will blow a fuse in the microwave. That's very rare. It can happen if the door switches are moved or out of alignment, or if one of the door switches, let's say the primary door switch failed to open when you open the door, then power would go through there and be a direct short. So the monitor switch has nothing to do with cooking. The secondary door switch won't even let you start the microwave. The primary door switch handles all the amperage from the fan motor, the turntable, and the transformer, this is the one that goes bad most often. So if you go up to a microwave, lights on and it's counting down and nothing's happening, then you want to go to the primary interlock switch. So now let's take a look at the, um, at the microwave. Let me see if I can turn it so you can see these door switches here. I know these wires are all in the way. I'll do my best to get them out of the way. But we have a door switch on the bottom. We have a door switch in the middle. And there's another door switch up here at the top. Say, OK, which one's my primary, my monitor, and my um, 
secondary. Well, first of all, I can tell you right now, most of them, this, the primary is usually the bottom of this one is not. If you look at the two wires going to this door switch down here, and I'll move these out of the way so you can see it. But if you see these two wires going to the door switch, that's this pink and blue wire right here. They run right to the control board on this plug. Those are the, those are the two wires right there that my thumb is on. They run right to that, that board. If we go back to the diagram for a second, that's these two wires right here. They said pink and green, but remember, it's not exactly the same diagram. Um, but it's connected right to the board on the plug on the board. So that's the door sensing switch or the secondary interlock switch. Now if we go back to the microwave, we have two other switches. One's a monitor and one's a primary. Let me see if I can bring the camera closer. What I want you to notice is look at the two terminals close together here. They're just like the, the secondary door switch. These two, the wires are farther apart. So the actual physical part of the switch is a little different. So if we look at this microwave door switch here, and I just messed up my other camera, so I'm just going to turn that one like this. So if we look at this one, look at how the two terminals on the door switch here are close together. But if you look at this one, this has a plug with three wires on it, but the two wires are far apart on the bottom and here. Uh, let me see if I can show the plug. They're far apart on the bottom and here. So this is the monitor switch. You notice that the, the door sensing switch, they're close together. It's almost like as if this red wire would have been in the middle. So this is your door sensing switch. This is your monitor switch and the wiring is different, but your primary is the same. I want you to notice something I noticed while looking at it. Look at the plastic on that, on that cover there. You see it by my thumb? You can see it's burnt. It's burnt. Yeah. And like I said that this switch, this switch here, and I'm going to try to fold it in front here so you can see it. Hold on one second. My mouse moved to mess me up. Uh, this switch here, I'll just set it down so I can focus the camera on it. This switch here handles all that amperage. Now it's hard to read. I can't really show it on there. They mark on the switch the terminals. And I don't know if I can if I can get the camera to see it good. Maybe about there. They mark N O N C and common. Common is always the bottom one. The one in the middle is N O, and if we had one on the top, that's N C. So let's take a look at this switch. I'm going to take the switch apart and show you inside. I just dropped a piece. One second, guys. So these switches are easy to open up. So if you ever change these switches, take them apart and look at them so you understand how they work. Give me one second. I'm putting it together so I can show you. So if we look here on this switch here, um, again, the, the camera's not that clear. Right by my thumb is the actual switch contact. Watch when I press down what it does. I'm going to have to hold it here. Sorry I can't get any more focused. It's, it's hard here. So you can see this. So right now that contact's open until the door closes. That's the way the primary and the secondary door switch work. It's open and closed. If we looked at it, you can see the point on this switch. Can you see how burnt it is? I know, again, I'm sorry, can't get it focused with a, a USB camera. But you can see how burnt that pin is. Still, it is not a good picture. I don't know how to make it any better here. Let's see if I can add more light so it will focus. That ain't helping. But that is what's wrong with this particular microwave is this door switch here 
the points have burnt up. So I teach my class, if you learn the sounds of a microwave when it's starting up, you can determine whether the switches uh, are bad just by what is happening with the machine. You don't even need to take the microwave down to make tests. Let's go back over what each one does in the diagram and see if you guys can, can tell me which one does which. Let me go to here, share my screen. Let's go back to this diagram. Which door switch, if it was removed, wouldn't do anything in the machine? It wouldn't affect the machine's operation. The magnetron, right? No, which door switch? Oh. Primary, secondary, or monitor? Which one has has no bearing on the operation of the microwave? Monitor. Primary. It's the monitor. If I took that switch out, threw it in the garbage, and just left them wires hanging there, the microwave would still work. Because if you look, the monitor switch is parallel to the transformer winding. That's important. How many of you guys ever opened up a microwave and removed that control panel in the front, but you couldn't see the transformer? There was a fan in front of you. Have you ever seen that? Yes. OK. So you're like, well, you know, one of the first things I told you to do is check power to the transformer if it's running and not heating. But that would require you to take the fan out of the microwave or pull the whole microwave, excuse me, I got hiccups, pull the whole microwave down to see if you got power as transformer. But if you look, the one side of the, of the door switch, the monitor switch goes to one side of the transformer. And if you look at the other side, this yellow wire, it shows it goes to the relay on the board but it comes back here to the transformer. So if you can't get to this winding to check voltage, you could check it from the monitor switch. Let me go to the other camera and show you that if we're here and we wanted to check voltage to our transformer, well, I could do it right here, but on some microwaves, the fan's right here. This one, the microwave fan is up top to cool it. But if it was in front and you only got access through this opening here in the front, you can't get to it. But if we go to this monitor switch right here, we could even pull the wires right off the switch and we put our meter on AC voltage, put our meter leads in here where the wires are, and I press start on the microwave, I should have 120 volts there. That is the same as checking voltage to the transformer. So if I can't get to the transformer and do it right from the transformer, I can do it right from here on the monitor switch and check voltage. So I have my meter on ohms and it's not plugged in, but that is one way to check voltage to my transformer. So let's go back to the diagram. So which switch will cause the fan and turntable to run with the door closed and the customer didn't even press any buttons? The second hand? That is correct. Now, if that is happening, sometimes the customer will call you out and say, hey, um, uh, my microwave's going crazy. It, I hasn't even pressed start and it's running. And you get there and they unplug the microwave because it, to them, if they see the light on inside and they hear the fan motor running a turntable, they think that the transformer's on as well. The transformer won't be on because of this relay, and I'll, and I'll show you that in a minute on the board. But if those are running, customer will unplug the machine thinking that the machine's actually cooking so they're afraid and they unplug the microwave. So when you get there, if you plug the microwave in and you hear the fans and everything running, most likely the secondary switch is what's your problem. 
Now remember, I've had some people take switches out of the microwave and test them with the meter. And they're open and they're closed. They're open and they're closed. They, there's nothing wrong with this switch. Let me move on. You want to test the switch in the microwave. You can take the wires off, but you want to make sure that the door assembly that has two latches on it, that the latches are actually pressing down on the button of the switch. So if you look at this, I think I got a picture of the switch here. No, they don't have any pictures of the switches. Um, but if the um, if you took it out and tested it, the switch itself may be good, but the switch may not be actuated by the door. So you have to own each door switch out and take the wires off and check each door switch with the door open and the door closed to see that the switch is opening and closing. Now the primary door switch, can someone tell me if that switch was bad and you were there and you press time cook and start, what would you see if the primary door switch was the fault? The machine, the light would be on, it would be counting down, but nothing else would happen. Exactly. So there you go. I just told you how to check each door switch without omen it out you would see that, that the lights on and it's counting down if it's the primary. The secondary won't let you press start and will cause the fans to run with the door closed. And the monitor don't matter. The only time we change the monitor door switch, supposedly, that if you actually ordered a factory fuse, the, um, the main fuse that comes here on, 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 on the, the noise filter, um, sometimes they used to come with a monitor switch because the manufacturers thought process behind that was okay um, the microwave blew a fuse most likely the door switches were out of alignment and the monitor switch caused that to happen so let's change the monitor switch and the fuse at the same time do you have to do that no you can ohm it out and see if that switch is good but a lot of guys they see a bad fuse and they just change the fuse and they don't know why is the fuse blowing so we got primary door switch secondary interlock and monitor switch they all are safeties and each one has a different purpose now here's another one let's say that we we press start time cook press start and we wanted to check voltage to our transformer but we couldn't reach it so we we went to our monitor switch and we put our meter leads on these two terminals here and we had zero volts um, What's our problem? Now, lights on, fan and turntable are working, and it's counting down, but I don't have any voltage to my transformer. Take a guess, guys. Any guess. Bad relay on the board? Which one? Relay two. That is the correct answer. Yes. That this relay on the board most likely is the problem. If you have no voltage at here or at the transformer, but if we know these fans and turntable are working, we know that our primary interlock switch is good. The only other thing that sends power to this transformer is this relay on the board. So here we go again. Go to the microwave. Runs and don't heat. I go and check power in my transformer. I got no power, but I see the fans and turntable. Okay, ma'am, uh, you need a new board. So I did one voltage test, and I know the board's bad. Now, what would you do if, you, if you'd if you made this test and your board was bad? What would you do just to say, okay, well, the board's bad, but I... I want to make sure that there's nothing else in the microwave that's wrong. I want to make sure it's heating and everything because I don't want to order a $100 board for this microwave, come back to the lady's house and install it, and it's still not heating. And I already installed the board, so some places won't take it back. What could you, would put you do? A, could you put a cheetah cord on it? Yes, you could bypass that transformer. Now let me stop sharing and go to my camera. Uh, here we go. So what you could do is let's take a look at this control board here.
If you look at this control board, all of these are our door switches, fans, turntables, and everything on this plug. Our transformer is controlled usually by this big black relay on the board and it has two wires on it. Okay? If you wanted to test the microwave, you close the door and you take these two wires here and just put a jumper right on those wires and plug the microwave back in. Transformer should come on. That will not turn on anything else but the transformer. Doors closed. Do not open and close the door when you have this jumped out because you might blow the fuse. But doors closed, you put a little test wire, put it in the two holes here, just jump a wire from one point to the other, plug the microwave in, and you should hear the transformer come on, and if you put water in the, in the, in the microwave, it should start heating. If that's the case, that relay on the transformer is bad. I mean, I mean on the board is bad for the transformer. So all these little boxes, like I did the refrigerator video, all these little boxes are relays, okay? Even that white box is a relay. This is our power transformer coming into the board. These relays here, you notice how they're right above this plug because each one of these controls something different. Like most of them have lights underneath where you're cooking the stove and sometimes you can press the light button twice where you have bright light or a dimmer light. That's why you have more than one relay, bright light, dimmer light. And then you have fan, exhaust fan, it could have two or three speeds on your exhaust fan. So this other relays over here, uh, control. one of them controls your exhaust fan high-low. And then the other relay is the relay that controls your turntable and your fan motor. So that's what these wires are and that's what these relays are. But checking a fan motor or a turntable, it's just a matter of checking power to that motor. If you have power to the fan motor and the fan don't run, it's bad. If you don't, the board's bad. So a lot of things in a microwave can be done with just one or two tests and you're all done. A lot of people go up to these microwaves and they're scared. They're like, I don't understand a microwave. I don't know how to test a microwave and I don't know where to begin. Do you guys have any questions? So y'all can fix microwaves now. <laughs> Rick, that was a great, great class. I mean, there's a lot of nuggets there, definitely. That was awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. I will post this up on the website um, and put today's date on it. I'll upload it as soon as we, um, as soon as we finish with this class. Um, but if there's anything else on the microwave you'd like me to cover or anything about the microwave you don't understand, I, I, I'll be here to answer your questions. I can't believe how much I, you just learned in the last 15 minutes. It was <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So, so Rick. Yes. How do you deal with um, like um, the GEs or the Samsung with like a multiple board that controls different um, portion of the microwave? I mean, uh, that's like... You're talking about the logic board? From the main yeah. board, they have two boards. Well, usually, I'm, if you look at this board right here, if I took, can you see the mouse moving here? No. Okay, but if you look at the transformer in this picture, uh, let's just say, you look at this part right here, you can see my finger, right? Yes, I can okay. see it. So if we took it like right about here, the transformer is in the top half. This is all, the, the main control board, this is our logic board. So in a, mic, in a GE microwave, they just take this part which controls your fans and your turntable and, and your magnetron and everything else separate from this. This is the clock. This is, this is what says turn the fan on, turn the turntable on, and so forth. So this is what this part of the board does. <clears throat> so um, in, in a GE, they just take this board and, and this, instead of making it one board, they just make it two separate boards. So in, in the upper half of the board, that's the one that just tells the microwave to turn on and starts counting down and everything. The other half of the board is just the relays. I'm sorry, I'm watching the camera, not watching my hands. The other board is just the relays here. 
And if some things work and if some things not, we would just troubleshoot them the same way we troubleshoot anything else. If the fan's not working, do I have power to my fan? No, the board's bad. If the turntable's working, do I have voltage? Yes, the turntable's bad. Um, do I have power to my transformer? No, okay. Then there's a relay on that board that sends power there. So GE just takes the same board and just breaks it in half into two separate functions. I hope that answered your question. Okay, I got it. Because um, I, I remember not too long ago, I was working like a um, microwave oven. I think probably like has a display board. It has like a main control. It has like a relay board. It was like crazy. You know, that was the first one that I did. But um, I did. I got it done, but it was tough. Yeah, uh, like I said, you guys need to find some of these junk microwaves that people throw out or give away and just take them apart and start testing these components on your own and then if you have any questions say hey I, I had this microwave that I brought home and I'm testing it and I'm getting this or I'm not getting this reading and then I can go over a specific microwave with you especially if we have a diagram or I got some pictures of it but 99% um, of the microwaves all the door switches do the same thing I mean like if you took a KitchenAid drawer microwave or sand, you know sharp drawer microwave or or the KitchenAid where the door drops down inside the wall oven, they might be a little more complicated, but basically uh, the high voltage side is always the same four parts. So if it, you got any of those microwaves running not heating, go to the transformer, check to make sure you got power there first. If you got power there, you know it's one of your high voltage components. If you don't, you know it's either a door switch or a control board, but you know, if the door switch was bad, would the fan motor run? The only difference on some of those higher end units is sometimes they'll add extra door switches. You might have four or five door switches in some of these microwaves. And one door switch is going to stop the magnetron, and the other door switch are going to stop the fan motors and turntables. And the reason why they do that on some of them is probably because the amperage draw on some of those components is so high they don't want to burn the switches out like the one we had here. So, um, any other questions? Got it. Yes, I do have a question. Go ahead. Why, when you do like, you do have a microwave oven, right? And um, the oven is heating, but the microwave is not. I mean, what, what could be the issue there? Uh, well, remember, when you say microwave is not, is it not heating, but seems to be running? Exactly, yes. Okay, so uh, is the fans running, turntable running? Fan is running, um, turntable is running. If you put it like an oven, it would work. But um, when you put it like um, um, heating like um, to warm food, it would not. Okay, so oven is just like a regular convection oven. They usually have a, a, a standard heating element and a fan motor in there to circulate the mm -hmm. heat. So if it's not microwaving, you're going to do the same thing on that as you would do this. Do I have power to my transformer? The four high voltage components on that unit are the same. They just added a heating element and a fan to make it a convection oven. So okay, you, you gotcha. You troubleshoot the same way you troubleshoot any other microwave. All right, thank you. All right, guys. Well, we, we went about almost an hour and a half today, which I don't mind, but uh, hopefully... Uh, You'll have a little bit better understanding of the microwave, and we will. Uh, I'm just going to post this up on the on the uh, public forum and not the private sector today, uh, because I I think there was a lot of good things here that people might might benefit from. So uh, I appreciate y'all coming out, and then if you uh, if you run into anything, just you know send me an email or hit me up on the website. I'd be more than happy to help you guys. All right.